Okay, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today uh, for uh, AIWA, AIWA Los Angeles Las Vegas section uh, special event on Saturday, July 31st, uh, 2021. Uh, we have a distinguished speaker today and a very fun, uh, very inspiring topic. So uh, uh, enjoy it. Uh, but before the presentation start, we have a few uh, logistics to go through and uh, also tell you a little bit, a few words about AIWA. Okay, so first, thank you, thanks a lot to our head, AWA headquarters, uh, who provided this uh, great uh, Zoom platform. Uh, it's uh, really highly appreciated. And uh, one word about this uh, email notices. Um, if you are on our mail list, but you didn't see our email notices, uh, please check your spam or junk folder because you know some email provider put it there or even delete it automatically. So uh, in that case, if you cannot find it over there, uh, please let us know and uh, you can provide an alternate, uh, alternative email address. Why well, it means second you know, email address. Okay, so during this event, if you got disconnected, please keep trying to, uh, keep, uh, to reconnect. It should be just temporary. Uh, if your internet Wi-Fi is not stable or limited, you can use the, the Zoom app for video. Uh, but they mute the online microphone in the, instead using the phone to dial in. Um, then if you dial in, you cannot use the uh, chat feature. You can email me at the email address, or if you are in US, you can call me, uh, text me, and uh, tell me the question you want to ask or ask to be unmuted. And uh, please sign in Zoom, uh, use your real name so a speaker or uh, people can recognize you. And uh, our event have been always networking event. Uh, during in-person event, we always one hour at least or uh, before the, uh, the presentation and uh, sometime after the presentation to have a chance to network. But uh, you know, um, virtual event is a little bit hard to do that, but still you are welcome to interact with the uh, chat box and the type of your question in Q&A. Uh, this way it won't make, be mixed. And uh, Zoom is, uh, has improved the security and privacy issue However, uh, please don't talk about any sensitive business, personal, national security information. So uh, a few words about AIWA is uh, the, the, our goal is to shape the future of aerospace. And uh, it started from two distinguished organizations, uh, one founded by the Wright brothers, the other one founded by Robert Goddard and emerged in 1962. Uh, so overall, we have almost a 90 plus years of aerospace leadership. And we have almost 30,000 members around the world, um, headquartered in Western Virginia next to our Washington, DC. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of rare. We have different regions and uh, the, uh, for the area for us, we are region six. You can see on the left-hand side, West Pacific of America, um, <clears throat> that include California, Arizona, et cetera. Uh, our current president is Basil Hassan as an, um, and uh, our executive director is um, uh, Daniel Dunbacher, and uh, who was formerly NASA uh, uh, admis uh, 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 you know, uh, representative admis uh, in the management. And uh, our current section chair is Dr. Jeff, Jeff Prushell, who is AIW fellow, a Raytheon fellow, uh, is a, a ch uh, chief scientist. Uh, this is a few advantages for joining AIWA. You got networking opportunity, uh, you got update on latest technology trends, and uh, AIWA published. You know, as Dr. Uh, Professor Pan mentioned, uh, he also published in AIWA, so it's AIWA published. So it's a professional organization. Uh, and uh, if we put the if you add our member if you're on the resume, it's good for you. Uh, it looks look really good. It's a very reputable organization. Uh, there's a few different category of membership and uh, uh, young professional who should have been called early career because they are actually professional, they are not students, uh, under 35 years old, but uh, after college. Uh, so then, uh, recently you have a, a new discount for the early career professional, 50% off. So, but you need to apply uh, early uh, just after graduate from college. Uh, we educated free, high school free. And we actually have a, a, a high school student member in uh, India uh, and uh, Canada uh, around the world. So it's very exciting. We post articles for them as well. So this is also a different view. As a One very key thing for AIWA is honors and awards. 
Um, <clears throat> so uh, you have this lab different level of, of membership, and also uh, if you uh, you know we can can nominate it for certain awards. The one thing is about honors. So members, if you uh, certain different years and uh, accomplishment, leadership, or contribution to AIWA, you can be elevated from member, senior member, associate fellow, fellow, uh, honorary fellow. So our doctor, uh, our second chair, Dr. Jeffrey Bushel Marasian, he's an AIWA fellow. Uh, it's like um, uh, also, for example, uh, Mr. Steve Izakowicz is a fellow, he's a president of Aerospace Corporation. And uh, uh, people you know that like Mr. Elon Musk, is an associate fellow. Uh, and the honorary fellow, you can see this, the, the CEO uh, of uh, SpaceX, Miss Queen Shuckwell. And uh, we have Buzz Aldrin, his honorary fellow, Neil Armstrong, and the former NASA Human Space Flight Director, uh, uh, Dr. Bill Gerstenmeier, he is uh, also honorary fellow. So uh, if you have contribution or um, accomplishment in different level, paper, uh, technical leadership, uh, or just service or the kind of things and got honored. For, for example, uh, lower lab is the Dr. Babalakwa. He invented F-35 Vito uh, engine and uh, he got the Guggenheim you know, um, medal in 2017. On the right, CEO, um, this is Honda aircraft, is the Michimasa Fujino, Mr. Uh, Dr. Fujino. He got the Reed Awards uh, this, this year. And uh, student membership, you know, you got to uh, be able to, uh, uh, you got to be able to att attend the annual regional student paper conferences and the design build and fly contest, essay contest, and uh, you have scholarship opportunities. And uh, as I said, the resources for LWA members, uh, LWA ARC, uh, and the Engage and the Foundation. And you know, recently, uh, Blue Origin just donated $1 million uh, to. Uh, AIWA Foundation, which is mainly for education, uh, for for uh, it's a, a club of the future, and we have industry industry guy is a great resources for you looking for business or opportunities. AIWA Career Center is a great place to find jobs or employees, employer, uh, those things. Uh, AIWA events, national events, you have online. You can look at AIWA.org. Uh, at the bottom, you can see, I think this one already passed, and uh, you can see Mr. Sean O'Keefe is the former NASA administrator. So with Adaboy, he got a lot of great uh, uh, speaker, uh, like uh, you know, Professor Pond, and uh, it's topic like uh, hypersonics, very hot. In November, we have Ascend, it's an event which is supposed to replace our former uh, flagship space conference. Uh, it's great, it's uh, for space economy, technology, uh, all kinds of things for this very exciting time. You can see, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, Mr. Jeff Bezos and the Sir Richard, Rich Bran Richard Branson and many Elon Musk, many great excitement. And uh, a few words about uh, the local area of uh, Los Angeles, Las Vegas section. Uh, it's uh, heavily aerospace populated. If you don't want to call it the center of aerospace, it is at least one of the main center of aerospace. All the major aerospace company, you name it, uh, in America uh, has a present, huge presence here. SpaceX, of course, headquartered in, uh, right next to us. JPL is very close to us. Uh, aerospace Corporation and the Northrop Grumman, uh, who's going to launch a James Webb Space Telescope and a company developing defense, um, fighter jet, uh, Northrop Grumman, uh, Boeing, Lock Lockheed, uh, they're all around here. Virgin Galactic, Virgin Orbit right here, SpaceX, and the many student uh, opportunities, uh, 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 groups. And uh, electric hybrid uh, flying car, sustainable aviation, huge presence here. We have new company, Relativity Space, use 3D printing to print rockets, a launcher space, uh, you know, and then more 3D, 3D printing, and uh, we have Rocket Lab, uh, sorry, it's not mentioned here, it's a very good company. And of course, Racy and Honeywell, Aerojet, Rocky Time, uh, Boeing, Lucky Mountain. And uh, locally, we have also events uh, keep doing, you know, so today we have uh, a couple of events coming up. So please join us uh, to, um, uh, you know, network and uh, see what's going on in aerospace and AIWA. And uh, we also have aerospace, uh, you know, new state opportunities. So this month we feature 
you know, this is a great, exciting activity, you know, uh, so you see the uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, Sir Richard Branson, then we have a uh, Sarisha in space with uh, Virgin Galactic, and we also celebrate the moon landing and the Vikings landing on Mars anniversaries. And uh, we have newsletter articles uh, ranging from events, you know, anniversary, you know, or exciting business technology. Uh, so if you have any idea or something, you know, uh, a welcome, you know, we will do the best to review and publish. And uh, Ms. Kushbu Patel is our, uh, is our uh, K-12 outreach uh, officer, and uh, we have new high school membership. K-12 is for high school and below. Uh, it's very important for aerospace. And uh, we have uh, a video, this event is being recorded after which we post it on YouTube and our, our website so more people can, can look at it. And uh, this is Engage and the daily launch. If you're a member, you receive it every day. And Aerospace America is a great magazine. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, so you get a great discount for attending AIW conferences. Uh, this is uh, five uh, flagship uh, AIW national conferences. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a really great opportunity to, to see you know, what's going on and uh, meet uh, uh, fellow aerospace uh, practitioners. And uh, you'll meet a lot of exciting people you were not able to meet elsewhere. Uh, so our Great distinguished speaker today is a wonderful professor, uh, Professor Rajkumar uh, Pant. Uh, is the aerospace engineering department and uh, in IIT Bombay in Powai, Mumbai, India. Um, he has also worked in five years in the uh, Hindustan Aer Aeronautics Limited in the design and engineering department. He is an alumnus of College of Aeronautics, Cranfield University in the United Kingdom where he earned his PhD and the Commonwealth Scholarship Scheme and the IIT Madras, where he ob obtained his Master's of Aeronautical Engineering. He has published and uh, presented more than 245 scientific papers, of which more than 180 are in international journals and the conferences. He was a visiting faculty for a year, um, <clears throat> each at Nanyang Technology University in 2016 and the Virginia Tech in 2010 uh, to 2011. He has also, he has also carried out several short-term assignments at several top-ranking institutes and universities all over the world, such as Instituto Tecnologico de Aeronautica Brazil in 2012 and Texas A&M in 2011, Cambridge University 2008, and Imperial, Co Imperial College London in 2006. In, um, sorry, this is in 2012. He has appointed. He has. He was appointed as a special visiting researcher in the, the Science Without Borders program of the Brazilian government for a three-year project. Uh, he was honored with the D.P. Josh Excellent Teacher Award in 2014 in recognition of his merit, achievements, and the enthusiasm for teaching and making a lasting impression on students. In 2019, he was uh, felicitated by Institution of Engineers uh, India as an eminent engineering personality in aerospace engineering. Recently, he has received special recognition in academic excellence as a faculty national category, award uh, by Institution of Engineers in India. So without further ado, let's heartily welcome uh, Professor Pant. Thanks a lot, Ken. Thanks a lot uh, for <clears throat> such a nice uh, introduction. Um, I'll just uh, go ahead straight away. Uh, kindly confirm that my screen is visible so I can get started. Yes, you can see it. Uh, a, very, a very good morning to all the people uh, in the Los Angeles and Las Vegas area uh, and in California and also uh, a uh, late evening to all the friends and associates joining in from India. Uh, today we are going to take a short journey into the area of lighter than air systems. Systems which have fallen by the wayside and <clears throat> not really many people know about them. Uh, but I'll use the next about an hour and a half at the max to introduce you to these systems and talk about their uh, 
you know, benefits, benefits, merits, demerits, etc. So first of all, to start with, let us address the question, what exactly are lighter than air systems? So friends, these are systems in which the principal lifting force comes from the buoyancy. When I say the principal lifting force, I mean that we are not looking at only buoyancy as the source, because when these systems move in the air, there is some relative motion and hence some amount of aerodynamic lift is generated. But that is not more than normally 15 to 20%. Okay. And buoyancy, as you all remember from your school days, is a tendency of a body to float or rise when submerged in a liquid. And it's a function of uh, the difference between the mass of the fluid that the body displaces and its own mass. Uh, buoyancy was discovered by this gentleman, Archimedes, who has done so many things in his lifetime. And this is how he discovered the uh, phenomena of buoyancy while having uh, his bath. Okay. Now, there are many, many <coughs> candidates for LTA gases. Actually, any gas or a mixture of gases whose density is or net density is less than that of the ambient air that would qualify as an LTA gas. I'm going to use the short form LTA for lighter than air systems very, very frequently. <clears throat> so the two most famous gases which most people know about are in the order of the lifting capacity, hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen is the most efficient gas, however, because it is highly inflammable, there are many people who are worried about the safety issues. But I must share with you right now that if you want to create sustainable LTA systems, then we need to learn to live with hydrogen because the next candidate, which is reasonably uh, good lifting capacity is helium, which is very nice. It's a, it's a noble gas. It doesn't catch fire. In fact, it douses the fires. However, it's a very rare gas and it's a very short supply. So therefore, sustaining an economy of LTA systems using helium is going to have a lot of logistics and cost issues. But these are not the only two gases. There are other gases or other mixtures which can also be qualified as LTA. And there is a list of many, many of these gases. And here I have written them in the descending order of their lifting capacity. So carbon monoxide, the, the gas which the world is trying to get away with because it's because of its uh, polluting nature can also be collected and used as a lifting gas. But if you notice, the lifting capacity is very, very small, just about 60 grams per cubic meter. So if you can make a balloon of a cubic meter size, which is weighing less than 60 grams, then even if you fill carbon monoxide, you will, you will definitely get a little bit of lift. But it's very, very difficult to make a balloon with such a light weight and also to make it structurally capable to lift any payload. So therefore, the whole world generally limits itself to only hydrogen and helium. And also we use steam or uh, there are also many examples of using hot air. Uh, okay, so... The first man-made LTA system was made up of paper, and it was uh, many, many years before Wright brothers flew their aircraft. It was in September 1783, and uh, you know it flew for a very short distance, about two miles, at a height of 1,700 feet. Okay, but this is a very important slide because it tells you at a glance the basic difference between the lighter-than-air systems about which we will look today and the heavier than air systems about which we have much better knowledge. So the conventional aircraft, gliders, helicopters, they all come under the purview of heavier than air systems. So we notice that there are three red boxes and two green boxes for the heavier than air systems and it's the opposite for the lighter than air systems. So let's have a quick look. Heavier than air systems, they do not have aerostatic lift. So they have to fly at certain minimum speed 
in order to be able to generate lift because their whole working principle is based on the relative motion between the body and the ambient air. So all heavier than air systems need to operate at a speed above a particular speed called as a solid speed. And in a helicopter, you need to move the rotor at a certain minimum RPM to generate the lift to overcome the weight. Also, heavier than air systems are fuel guzzlers. They consume large amount of fuel and hence in the current scenario where the humanity is looking at uh, green uh, aviation, the heavier than air systems actually score very poorly there. And as we all know, they are complex mechanisms. But these two factors, the ability to fly fast and also the ability to handle changes in the weather, these are the two major abilities because of which the heavier than air systems outperform the lighter than air systems in today's scenario. And that is why many of you may not actually have seen the LTS systems operating. Although they have three greens, but the two reds, the fact that they are slow, now they can go even as high as 100 kilometers per hour, but still that is considered to be slow. Compare that with uh, very high speeds at which the HTA systems can fly. But the basic problem or the major limitation of the LTS systems due to which you do not see them so often being used is that they are only fair weather vehicles and they are very much susceptible to weather changes. But when I say weather changes, the main problem with LTS systems is only when there is a huge disturbance in the wind. Okay, If there is a constant rain or even a snowfall, we can still manage to operate them as long as the winds are not very wild. But the moment there is disturbing wind, the LTS systems start developing problems and to, be, to make them operate safely, we need to bring them down. And a large amount of research is being done to handle these two problems of the LTS systems. And all researchers are trying to make these red boxes into yellow or green boxes. And when that happens, it becomes uh, automatic choice for various applications. Now, there are conventional and unconventional LTS systems. So first, we will look at the conventional systems. Broadly, you can consider three types. The one on extreme right is a hot air balloon, which generates lift by using hot air. Unfortunately, it has no directional control. So it just goes where the ambient wind takes it. Okay, And the only control that... Uh, a pilot of this particular system has is to change the buoyancy in the vertical direction. Okay, Because of that, these are very interesting uh, platforms for adventure or for tourism or for excitement. But remember, they are from they are, they can be considered to be from here to anywhere systems. So we really cannot use them for any serious work. And hence, I'll not talk about them a lot today. I'll focus my attention today only on the two other type of systems. The one in the center is essentially an aerial platform. It's not an aircraft because it doesn't fly. It just floats, okay? And therefore the name is Aerostat, an aerospace system that is designed or that wants to, that is supposed to remain stationary. It's an oxymoron. How can an aircraft remain stationary? But yes, an aerostat is meant for that. It is unpowered. There is no power plant on an aerostat, on a conventional aerostat. It only has stabilizing surfaces that you see on the back. And on the bottom, you can see they have put a small covering over a payload, which is carried inside. In this case, it is a radar system. And you have a cable called as a tether, which attaches the balloon or the envelope to the ground. I'll talk about it in more detail. And on the extreme left is an airship which is just like a ship that floats on water. This is a ship that floats in air. So it is actually dynamically and behavior-wise more towards ships than towards aircraft. Okay? It is powered and it has directional control due to which it can fight the ambient wind to a certain extent. So we have these two major LTS systems and these two photographs are 
of the systems that have been developed in uh, our laboratory by students and researchers. So what I'll do is I'll first go into the less exciting part, which is the aerostat, and then go to the more exciting part, which is the airship, because airships can move around, aerostats can remain stationary. So they are generally considered to be quite boring, but they are very, very useful because they actually help you in doing so many interesting things. So what are aerostats? Basically, aerodynamically shaped platforms, and you can have any payload on them. The most common ones are communication equipment and surveillance equipment like cameras. The desired features of the aerostat is that it should be able to carry a large amount of payload and it should be able to maintain a specified altitude. Okay, it should not go up and down as the weather changes or when you deploy it during day and night, uh, it should not uh, you know, come, rise up and come down by a large extent. So there has to be some buoyancy control and also some automatic buoyancy control features. And it should remain stable in ambient wind as far as possible. And all these aspects are greatly affected by the shape of the envelope. Okay, so here is an example of a very small, easily relocatable aerostat system, which is in this case mounted on a pickup van, and it just remains uh, up in the air for a long time. Okay, uh, I'll just quickly go through the parts of the aerostat. So you have the envelope or the helium chamber or the hydrogen chamber. You have a small air bag inside the gas bag to control the buoyancy, as I mentioned to you. We need to look at the day and night uh, uh, temperature effect on the balloon. It should not lose the altitude. Plus, it can also be used for relieving the stresses on the envelope. Then there are some tail fins which give you stability. There is a tether or a cable which is attached to the ground. And the payload, as I said, can be anything. But to operate an aerostat or to move it up and down and to hold it when we don't want it to uh, move around with the winds, we need a winching and a mooring system. Okay. So the question arises is that when we have aircraft, when we have satellites, then why do we need aerostats for surveillance applications or communication applications? So here is a comparison between the features of an aerostat and an aircraft. Okay, But I am not saying that an aircraft like the F-16 can be compared with the aerostat shown on the left-hand side. These pictures are only for representative purposes. Kindly don't draw the conclusion that this aerostat is equal to this aircraft. Okay. So what do we see? We see that an aerostat needs good weather and it remains stationary. But it has zero fuel consumption and it can remain up in the air for a very long time. 30 days is not very uncommon. And it, is not, it doesn't require an airport or any other great infrastructure facility on the ground. It can be launched from any terrain. Okay, but there is a problem with the, uh, uh, on the aircraft, you know, there are other uh, issues which are marked in the red color. However, it can work in good weather, bad weather, and also achieve high speeds. So if you want to use an aerostat for surveillance purposes, because you want to keep it for a very long time, you need to, you know, stay with its limitations of remaining stationary and also needing reasonably good weather conditions. What about satellites? Satellites are also now available and they are deployed by so many countries, including India, very gainfully for surveillance. But satellites are far away. Okay, they are very far away. They are very, very expensive. And once you launch them, after about a year or so, they may become obsolete because of the developments in technology. You cannot bring them down very easily and refurbish them. Whereas an aerostat can be made in a very cost-effective manner. It can be relocated very easily. It can provide surveillance at an area where you are interested, not maybe all over the world. Okay, right. Now, aerostats actually can go to very high altitudes and they can also carry a reasonably large amount of payload and give reasonably uh, good uh, coverage. It depends on the size and the altitude at which you deploy them. There are many applications of aerostats, which are already quite popular. The most common one is for surveillance and communication. This is the most common application of aerostats all over the world. And then you can also go for local area surveillance. You can also go for special applications like protecting your aerodrome against enemy aircraft, uh, which will try to come and bomb it. So this was very interestingly used by 
the allied uh, army in the second uh, second world war when they were protecting the aerodromes and some applications uh, we don't have too much time today to go into great detail so i'll just touch upon one small experiment that we had done in india about a couple of years ago 3 years ago we wanted to demonstrate the usage of aerostats for providing communication in a post disaster scenario so we designed and fabricated this aerostat and then it was deployed and tested uh, for providing communication it's a day and night system so when because it is a day and night system there is a requirement to illuminate the envelope at the night time so that any other helicopters or other aerial traffic does not get you know affected and they know that there is a vehicle there why do we need this because we were able to deploy this aerostat for one week non stop without any need to bring it down except when we want to reconfigure the aerostat with some other communication system so what i'm going to do is i'm going to share a small video that shows the testing of this aerostat i just want a confirmation that the video is visible yes i hope yes. the video is visible thank you thanks so much so this project was done this is a weather station which is mounted aboard on board the aircraft on an aerostat to give us a data about the uh, weather conditions and then there are certain electronic and electronic equipment <clears throat> you can see we just raise the wing slowly up to the desired altitude and then use uh, leds on board which are remotely switched an aerostat can also be used for surveillance as you can see in this particular picture There is an antenna hanging below for communication, but we can also mount a small camera. And that camera can be used to see. What you are seeing now is a Wi-Fi system to provide Wi-Fi in the local areas in case of a disaster to try and help the rescue mission. So there are three Wi-Fi antennae here. That has a field of view of 120 to 360 degrees coverage. As I mentioned. This aerostat was deployed non-stop for a one-week period, and during that one-week period, we did three trials. Okay, we did three trials on this system. We used it first for providing 2G, 3G, 4G data and voice communication using a classical uh, mobile network uh, backhaul. We then also tried to uh, check the efficacy by providing Wi-Fi antenna, and then finally. uh as i will show you some a little bit later we also used it for looking at the emergency communication uh using the wireless system that is used by the <coughs> policemen and the rescue operators so it is launched by a uh, press of a button uh and it can then remain stationary up reasonably for a reasonable period of time without too much now here you can see we are using it for aerial surveillance also We did a small camera, which was, and then this is a this is a system by which we do the monitoring of its health, and also we keep a track. The system can be used in mild rain and also in uh, weather conditions. This is a police wireless antenna, which was installed on the last day, and with this particular wireless system, we were able to get the best results. Uh, we were able to deploy this, uh, keep this system on board for a whole day. and we were raising to various altitudes and checking the efficacy of the communication so these kind of uh, systems can be easily developed these are not expensive at all and the best part is that once you fill it up with the gas in this case we have used hydrogen gas there is absolutely no operating cost after that it just remains stationary up in the air till you need it okay so in our trial we found that we could deploy it for some to two hours we could handle winds of around 40 km per hour we went to a height of around 144 meters and we established the calling <clears throat> we found that with the radio frequency antenna we were able to get a 2 km radius coverage with the wifi sector antenna we could get 1 km radius communication but with the police wireless antenna we could talk 60 km from the site of deployment and that's a pretty good system for providing communication okay so this is what uh, you know we did about uh, aerostats maybe this is a good time to 
open up slightly and take any questions regarding aerostats before we move on to airships. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just uh, uh, go back to the, you know, I'm just going to stop the sharing. And if there is anyone who would like to ask any question, I see in the chat, okay. Yeah, if there are any quick questions regarding aerostats, maybe we should just take them at this time. Yes, folks, okay. if you, um, if you have in Q&A or raise your hand. Yeah. So there is there's a hand raised by Mr. Kent. Yeah, there's a one in the Q&A box by Ravi. Okay. So what is the question there? Okay, in the Q&A, okay. Would be great to find out the communication bandwidth from SAT to aerostat to ground. Okay, so Ravi, I would uh, like you to establish a contact with me and I will be able to answer this question offline because we don't have time right now to go into such kind of details. I'm just typing my email address and sending it to you. So please, you can uh, send me your mail. Okay, uh, right. Anybody else has any question or we'll go back to airships now because believe me, airships are much more exciting and much more uh, intriguing. Okay. If someone wants to speak out, you can raise your hand and maybe we will be able to unmute. Uh, Professor uh, the, uh, uh, Kent, uh, Dr. Tobiska, uh, yeah. type in a question in Q&A. Is there a maximum altitude for given volume of gas? Yes, there is. There is a maximum volume, which is called as the pressure height at which you find that the lift available because of buoyancy is not enough for you to lift. So that number varies. Uh, and, you know, what we do is we actually design the aerostat, uh, especially its shape and its volume, uh, keeping in mind the requirements of the operator. So if the operator, in this case, for example, the operator said that we want to go to a height of maximum around 80 meters. So we designed accordingly, but we during our testing, we went to a higher altitude with lower payloads. So if we want to maintain the payload, then we will have to, uh, you know, size the aerostat for that particular reason, keeping in mind the weather conditions, the temperatures, the humidity, and all those parameters. Okay, so maybe I should just go back now to, uh, go back now to the uh, presentation and, uh, go to airships. Okay, right. I'll, I'll just do that. So we come back now. Uh, all right, so now we proceed. Now we proceed to the airships. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I think they are the ones which have already been answered. Uh, okay. Now we move to airships. So, <clears throat> Uh, all these pictures that you see are pictures of airships which have been uh, developed in our institute or uh, deployed in the, at various locations in the institute. So we are going to look only at airships now in this particular presentation. Like any aircraft, the same four forces act on airships. Okay, And out of these, as you all know, the weight and the drag are natural forces, but in case of airships, even the lift comes as a natural force because of the buoyancy primarily. And when it moves, as I said, it will generate more lift because of the dynamic uh, lift uh, component. But if you are looking at a stationary system, you will find that there's a very simple formula that tells you how much volume of balloon you need to carry. So if you want to create a particular amount of buoyant lift LB, you just have to look at two things. The difference in the density of the ambient air around the balloon envelope and the density of the gas inside and also the volume of the envelope. So you want more LB, either you can increase the volume or you can increase rho A. Rho A is the ambient air density. You can increase it by flying at a lower altitude, but maybe that is not in your control. But what is in your control is to use a lighter gas so you can reduce the value of Roji. These are the only things available uh, to a person to control the lift. Now, just like an aircraft, there are certain components on the, on the, of an airship. The difference is that in the case of an airship, the, 
the body that contains the LTA gas called as the envelope for which the analogous uh, parameter in the aircraft is the wing, that is much larger in size than the gondola, which is equivalent to the fuselage in an aircraft. Okay. And then in the control surfaces also, normally you see only one vertical fin and two horizontal fins in an aircraft. But in an airship, because they fly at low speeds, you generally see uh, you know, four of them, two horizontal and two vertical. But they could be aligned either in this configuration as shown, which is called as a plus configuration, or they could be in a cross configuration also. Okay. Now, structurally speaking, there are four kinds of configurations. The one on the top left is what was historically used, a rigid airship, where the entire structure is rigid, and inside that you have gas bags. And the one on the bottom left is the one which is most common nowadays, called as a non-rigid airship, where there is no mechanical or solid structure inside the airship. The shape is completely maintained by the internal overpressure of the envelope. Okay. So there are no structural members inside. There are some cables, etc., but there are no structural members. A cross between the two rigid and non-rigid is a semi-rigid airship, very popular today, where you have a structural framework inside, but you don't have a solid covering. You have an envelope type covering. And the one on the bottom right is very interesting. This is a hot air balloon, which is masquerading as, a, as an airship. Okay. So what you do is you make the envelope in the shape of an airship, and then you just fill it up with a hot air balloon. But remember that this airship, such airships have very, very poor lifting capacity because they are using hot air. And hot air can give you a very less lifting capacity. So this entire large envelope that you see can only carry one passenger, which is the pilot. So it's very good for promoting a product like Kit Kat. It's very good for adventure, etc. Okay, uh, there are definitely some applications, but mostly for adventure and excitement. When we hear the word airships, the next word that most people talk about is the Hindenburg, especially the Hindenburg disaster. But what people don't know is that the Hindenburg actually was a very capable system. And before the unfortunate accident that took place, it had more than 10 round trips between Germany and USA, crossing the Atlantic Ocean in about 50 to 60 hours. Something that was completely out of reach in the mid 1930s by other aircraft, by the fixed wing aircraft or helicopters. Yes, there was a disaster. And yes, uh, the airship uh, caught fire. But an important fact to be kept in mind is that as a result of the disaster, 35 people lost their lives, very unfortunate, but 62 people also were able to survive. Okay, And among the people who lost their lives, mostly they were the crew members who you know, very valiantly decided to stay on board till the last minute to help the passengers to be evacuated. So now please tell me, Think of an aircraft crash in which an aircraft approaches for landing and for some reason catches fire. How many people do you think are going to survive? Okay, probably none of them. But in this case, the aircraft caught fire during landing. 35 people did die, but 62 people survived. This fact is not talked about. What is talked about is that, oh, there was hydrogen, it caught fire, etc. So, you know, when we look at accidents, we have to understand that accidents have their own reasons, their own learnings. This is how the airships were revived in the mid 80s, not by Pink Floyd, but by a company called uh, Sky, you know, <coughs> Airship Industries. And they came up with this model called Skyship 600, which was rented by Pink Floyd to promote one of their albums in a world tour. Now, this is how modern airships are. Okay. I'll just try to show you a small video of uh, the operation of a You can see now, there is a mass truck which is now moving away. There are two motors that are visible to you. And there is one on the back side. When the clearance is given by, and look at the number of people on the ground. There are just about four people on the ground. Earlier, there used to be 
scores of people on the ground holding the balloon. Now we don't need that with the new technology. So once there is a clarity of, uh, once the permission is given to take off, the engines are tilted up and the airship goes for a clean vertical takeoff. And look at the location, friend. This is a, this is a ground where the cars are operating. And that's it. The airship can operate from there. Once it clears the ground and reaches the decent altitude, the engines are again tilted forward. Then she starts flying like a normal engine. Perfect. And now you can see one more engine mounted at the uh, at the rear at the stern. Okay, so this is a three-engine system. This is how modern airships are. Okay, but look at the size, the size of the gondola, which can seat in this case around 14 passengers, is so small compared to the 7,000 cubic meters of the envelope. Okay, so there are many USPs of airships. Okay, some of them are listed here. But I always say that application of airships, the usage of airships are all limited by actually your imagination. Okay, if you are able to think of an application where you need stationary low speed flight in a very low vibration environment, less noise environment, you can go for airships. These are the existing application of airships in the order in which they are used. Okay, and I'll just quickly show you one of them. So a few of them. So the most common application of airships all over the world is to promote a product. Okay, so the Goodyear blimp or the Fuji blimp is world famous now. It is one of the records of a non-stop advertisement contract which has been going on till early 70s till date. Okay. Similarly, one can use it for aerial sightseeing. This is what used to happen a few years ago in uh, your Las Vegas area. This is Las Vegas by air. So there was a company operating an airship with four seats in which passengers would hop on board and then just enjoy Las Vegas by air. Uh, there are also several applications of airships as a tourism uh, vehicle. So I like to definitely show you a fantastic video uh, by the Zeppelin company, which shows you how beautiful it is to fly on an airship. You can see the internal structure here of carbon fibers on which we, uh, you know, put the envelope. This is the installation of the vertical tail. Now you can see uh, people, passengers boarding the aircraft. Small gondola, but it has a small toilet in the back also. Because airship flights can last for about an hour and a half, two hours or more. Very smooth and very comfortable takeoff. It's almost gliding. Such kind of aerial views at such a low speed are very difficult to achieve by any aircraft except in a helicopter, but in the helicopter, there will be so much of vibration and so much of noise that you have to probably wear ear mufflers. You cannot do the things that these people are doing, you know, very quietly and very in a relaxed atmosphere. You can fly, float in the sky, literally, like a ship on water. So these flights are so popular that they are overbooked for the next few months, okay? Probably for a couple of years, there are no seats available for these flights. They take place from a place called Friedrichshafen in Germany. You can use airships for tracking sport events where you do not create disturbance to the animals below. You can use it for corporate hospitality by hiring the whole cabin for a team of people who can have a nice, relaxed meal in the air. But as I mentioned, you can also use it for several applications which are, uh, you know, very imaginative. In this case, uh, an airship was used for detecting the mines which have been buried post the Kosovo conflict. 
uh, there were many mines which were kept buried inside and many people were losing their lives or limbs or cattle was being killed. So the UN has funded this project in which an airship is flown at a slow pace with special detection equipment, which uh, give pictures like this to indicate the presence of a mine, a landmine, and then people can be directed to go and remove the landmine. Olympics are going on right now in Tokyo. In many Olympic games in the past, airships have been used by the police for aerial surveillance and for security. And there is a very popular video of the Atlanta Olympics in which a person who was trying to enter the Olympic uh, arena with a gun was detected by an airship. And before he could actually make uh, his entry, he was intercepted by the police and arrested. So I'll quickly show you some of the airships that we at IIT Bombay have dealt with. Okay, The first one that we flew was way back in 2002. And this one is called as a micro airship, very small, designed by students and researchers in my laboratory. Uh, you can see 2002 batch of my department. And we are flying it in the Gymkhana ground of uh, our institute. On the airship, you will read something called as PADD. And you will see very soon what that stands for. So <clears throat> PADD actually... Uh, here you can see the amount of controllability you can have on a remotely controlled airship. So PADD is a short form from Program for Airship Design and Development, which was carried out in my department by a group of engineers. Yeah, that's how we started our airship activity. And this is one of the flights that we attempted to uh, test the working of the airships and to see how much control we can have on them. And then we were contracted, uh, you know, to, we were contracted to use it for several interesting applications by various agencies. So one of them you can see here is uh, an airship that was uh, designed for snow cover evaluation in the lower Himalayas in North India. What we are doing here is flying it under remote control as a showcase to, uh, there was an international conference on snow and avalanches. There were around 350 scientists from all over the world. And we actually flew this airship as a small demonstration to them on the efficacy of remotely controlled airships to fly at high altitudes with reasonable payload. In this case, we were actually carrying a small IP camera and that IP camera was programmed to take images at every three seconds. You can see now the series of images that were taken from the IP camera on board. The purpose of this IP camera images was that the snow cover evaluation scientists are interested in high quality images. They are not interested in videos because they want to process the image. So therefore, and also we also had another interesting system that these images were encrypted and they were sent down uh, by a video downlink to a laptop where they were decrypted and played in real time. So there is no onboard recording. Okay, There is no onboard recording. So in case we lose this vehicle to, uh, you know, because of the bad winds or whatever reason, there is no data on board which will get in the hands of uh, <clears throat> undesirable elements. So it's a completely secure system which can be used for aerial Photograph. This is our, these are images of the testing laboratory where we had done these trials. This was in the year 2009, in the month of April. And, uh, you know, the snow had just uh, stopped and it was, uh, it, it did snow during our, uh, during our uh, stay there. And also it rained. So we were very lucky that we were able to test our airship flying in mild rain as well as in a little bit of snow. So very soon you will see some images of airship flying in rain. You will also see some images of the same. The whole system is air uh, waterproof. So therefore there is no problem in operating it in mild rain, especially when the winds are not very heavy. We also fly during night time to demonstrate it as a possibility of an aerial vehicle for aerial surveillance. And uh, in this case, we were acquiring the airship using the headlights of a truck, you know. 
<clears throat> so it's a very versatile system and in the hands of an able operator it can easily be launched you see the takeoff and launch is also very easy you don't require any great piloting skills for takeoff and landing but of course to control the airship you do require uh, some things as i mentioned application of airships are limited by only your imagination okay so at this point of time i would like to again stop the presentation and i have a few more slides talking about the modern lta systems but this is a good time for us to stop and to take any questions that you may have regarding airships we have just uh, i have a few more slides a few more presentations that to show you about the modern airships but any questions regarding airships are most welcome at this stage Yeah, uh, everyone, you're welcome to type in Q&A box um, or just click raise hand uh, to be able to speak out. Yeah, I, I do have a question. Uh, Professor, you mentioned about yes. uh, the unfortunate Hindenburg. And uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, but at, at, the, uh, at the same time, how about the cost? You know, these days when you manufacture, how does this uh, compare to uh, other options is the uh, operation and manufacturing is much cheaper uh, or is cost uh, and what do you think what is uh, preventing people using more airships? Okay, actually uh, the cost of manufacturing or making airships is actually quite low. Okay, because see the whole structure is basically if you look at a, if you look for example at an airship which is a non-rigid airship. The envelope is fairly simple. And uh, of course, there are, there are proprietary materials used for the envelope. So you do, involve, uh, you do have some costs in uh, procuring the material. But if you compare it to a comparable aircraft, okay, then they are much lower. See, as, a, as an academician, I only work mostly on autonomous airships or remotely controlled airships. Now, I really cannot make any manned airships because it's far beyond my capability as an academician. But the, the uh, you know, the, if, you look at, if you look at remotely controlled airships compared to remotely controlled aircraft, we are far cheaper and much easier to, uh, you know, manage the funding of that for the same amount of capability. So let's say if you want to do a surveillance for so many hours, Let's say you want a 30 hour surveillance. We can beat the UAVs hollow because of our fantastic endurance. Uh, Rakesh Kumar wants to know, is there any regulatory requirement to build and operate them? Yes, uh, there are regulatory requirements, just like we have a requirement for any aerial vehicle. There are regulatory requirements. There are in fact special regulations for airships. Both the FAA has released them and also, there is also now the European regulation which have uh, been uh, you know, announced. So, yes, there are regulations. Uh, they are considered to be almost like uh, the uh, other unmanned aerial vehicles. Okay. Uh, Ronald Cliburn has a question about potential for transporting heavy equipment or to remote areas or bringing back heavy material from remote areas. That is exactly the application, Ronald, for which the airships are now being considered as the best option for transporting oversized and large volume and large weight cargo in remote areas. Okay. Uh, Ravi Deepak has a question about worries about interaction with atmospheric electricity or other meteorological events. Yes, uh, if you fly at a very high, if you fly at a very high altitude, then you will try to enter the cloudy areas and then you will have all these issues. And then you can provide a same solution that you have on the aircraft. For an airship or aerostat, we normally build a Faraday cage around uh, uh, the airship to, you know, uh, to send down the, uh, to take care of the discharge of the static electricity. George Chow has a question about the risk to airlines traffic. Will FAA allow large quantity of such airships? Yes, George. It all depends upon what is the kind of traffic that is prevailing. I mean, if you are having a very busy air route and then you introduce airships in those routes, there might be huge interference because of the total difference in the way they are operated as well as the speeds at which they fly. So the air traffic controllers are going to have a serious issues regarding how to manage 
very slow flying traffic with a uh, traffic that goes at certain minimum speed so these are challenges for operations normally airships are going to be more useful for niche applications where we do not have the possibility of other modes as being really worthwhile so therefore the chance that is going to interfere with existing air traffic is normally quite less okay so there are generally dedicated areas in which airships are operated but you know the number of airships flying today are so less that you can just get a special permit my special special permission for those specific times to fly okay i'll be very happy to discuss uh, more details you know uh, over an email if you are interested okay so i'll again uh, write my email for you to uh, keep a note um there is a question from eta and i think this stands for the institute where i was uh, associated what are the advantages disadvantages of a tethered airship okay so a tethered airship is a beautiful cross between an aerostat and an airship it can move around little bit an aerostat remains stationary so you will have a better and then you can send the power from the ground so you don't have to carry huge batteries or uh, power system on board so it's a good compromise and i'm sure eta has done a lot of work in that area Uh, Rakesh Kumar has a question: Why in India or elsewhere not so popular in tourism? Is it cost or regulations? Rakesh, the answer is regulations, awareness, and the fact that it is not an all-weather vehicle. For a tourist application, one of the prime requirements is a good dispatch reliability. See, how would you feel, for example, that you go to a place? for uh, you know you go to a place for solving the for for your tourism applications and then you book a ticket and then you are told sorry today the winds are very high and therefore i'm sorry there is no flight you know there is no so the dispatch reliability of airships conventional airships is very poor and therefore although they can be used for tourism applications in certain areas and they are very popular for example in friedrichshafen flying over the bodensee but you know at many other areas uh, the dispatch reliability can suffer a lot and because of that it becomes unreliable i mean i had a personal experience uh, i have i have tried to get a flight on an airship on three or four occasions and it's my bad luck that every time i have gone i had a booking but it had to be cancelled during that particular slot so i am an example i, I in one in one case you will be surprised it was a paris air show i managed to hitch a ride on an airship but i sat in the airship for about 45 minutes waiting for the weather to improve and then it became dusk and they said we don't have permission for night flight so we had to step down so you know this fact reliability is a problem because of which it is not so popular among tourists so don't think of airships first for transporting people think of airships first for other applications which are long endurance which are low speed where other modes like aircraft or uavs may not be able to do especially the duration okay all right so i think what we'll do is there are no more questions uh, i'll just go back to my presentation and talk to you about a few other very interesting things um, these are related to the modern applications of airships as i mentioned to you whatever i have shown you so far is basically the conventional airships but now there are modern lta systems there are high altitude airships airships which are specifically meant for operating at high altitudes okay uh, let's quickly go through a presentation about high altitude airships also they they come under an high altitude long endurance platform so high altitude airships are being projected worldwide as the best mode for providing long duration communication 6 months 3 months even a year non stop location so they are at a height of between 15 to 25 kilometers because at that altitude all over the world at different places you have very low winds because the wind undergoes a change in the direction so there will be one bracket at every location where the wind will be very very small and if the winds are very small then you can use a small power plant to fight the wind and remain there these are mostly solar powered or hydrogen fuel cell powered 
and they can be used as communication platform for long endurance. This is what I was saying. If you look at, generally you find that between 16 to 20, uh, 25 kilometers, you know, normally the winds are very low in magnitude at these altitudes and therefore you are able to manage with lesser, smaller power plant. This is the conceptual image. It shows an aircraft on the bottom at around 10 kilometers, airships flying at around 20 kilometers and satellites, low earth satellites. So all of them can be together. So what are the applications of high altitude long endurance or hail airships? There could be applications in defense, there could be applications in civilian. And you know, there are so many applications available that all over the world, there are many, many research groups and countries which are trying to develop a high altitude airship. Okay. Uh, in the US, Lockheed Martin was a pioneer in coming up with interesting uh, solutions. Of course, many programs are now canceled or discontinued because of several reasons. Uh, and people are now moving into what is called as a hybrid airship, about which I will talk to you more. So when you do the design of such airships, you've got to look at several important parameters which affect its design. And then you can get the size, the shape, and the mass of the various components. And it's a fairly complicated business, as you can see in this particular flowchart, which I borrowed from one of my PhD students who graduated recently, uh, about four years ago. Uh, you know, three years, three and a half years ago. You can see that there is a coupling of so many disciplines and all of them affect each other. So therefore, high altitude airships is a huge research area. And we are also having a lot of people working with us. Okay. Um, would you like to take, uh, would you like to uh, ask questions at this stage? I think we should quickly go for questions every time uh, we talk about a new concept. So are there any questions uh, about high altitude airships? Yes, I, I do see. Uh, I do see uh, one question from Claude Nicola. Uh, we have a group at EPFL looking at the design of airships atmosphere from Mars. I'm coming to that. I'm coming to that. My next presentation is actually on airships for planetary exploration. So at that time, I'm going to answer this question. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'll answer the question. Uh, I'll answer the question in the next presentation when I talk about airship for planetary exploration. Okay. Uh, anybody okay. else? Uh, no, Rakesh okay. Kumar? Yeah. yeah, sorry. Rakesh, type a question. Yes, yeah. Rakesh has a question about is there any HA in operation? The answer is yes, but these are very secret projects. So uh, I'll talk about it. There are, uh, there are, there is apparently an HA which has been developed by China, which is in operation, but we don't have any confirmation of that from the authentic sources. Okay, so yes, they are being pursued at many places, and uh, you know they are. Uh, but you know, in in open literature, nobody is claiming that they are operating any HA right now. Okay, moving back now to the next important aspect which is on the hybrid airships, okay? And, but what I'll do is I'll probably go to the question raised because there is a more interest in planetary exploration. I'll come back to the hybrid airships later. Uh, let me just show you on what is happening. So there are many areas, uh, there are many interplanetary uh, or planetary exploration uh, projects. So for example, on the earth, high altitude airships, but then there are uh, proposals for exploring Venus, Titan, and Mars. The question was about Mars. I'll go to touch about that. We are working right now on two projects for uh, our, uh, you know, space agency. And I don't want to really share too much details, but we are looking at applications of scientific ballooning for various for various uh, roles. We are also looking at uh, these are some of the projects which have been taken, which have taken place in the past. The first one to fly successfully was this High Sentinel. This was the first successful deployed uh, HA for, uh, for demonstration purposes, okay. Now, this is what we have been doing. We have been looking at shape optimization of uh, the high altitude uh, airships under the uh, project. And, uh, you know, 
we we have actually got optimized shape for various cities because at different locations in the world there are going to be different conditions and the winds also are going to be varying so different shapes are optimal different location of the so there are some publications i have in this area and i'll be very happy to share with anybody who is interested uh, for venus we are looking at uh, very we did a we did a workshop in 2015 to look at how we can use lts systems to explore venus this was done in association with cnes and the indian space research organization and uh, you know <clears throat> we found that there are several challenges to be addressed when we are going in for such so the question is why is it venus because venus is a very interesting planet but we are not the first there have been many many missions to venus both within the united states and the european and the soviet union so the ones that you see in blue color are the projects carried out by united states the one in red color like venera and vega are the missions successful missions by the soviet union and also there have been some projects by the europeans okay which are uh, trying to explore either the surface of the venus or the atmosphere of the venus or they are doing an orbit and fly by so based on the knowledge gained uh, there is a very interesting review paper that we have written on uh, all the missions that have been taken place to explore venus and uh, again i'll be happy to share that with anybody it's uh, available in the progress in aerospace sciences okay so okay this is just a detail so these are some previous missions there is a vega okay then there was a concept uh, tried by nasa for deploying an aerostat uh, an airship which will expand out uh, this particular project has already been completed i mean the, the the calculations and the design has been completed and it is now in an archival stage okay uh, similarly this is an interesting concept in which we use a phase change uh, fluid inside a balloon and with the ambient temperature change this fluid undergoes change in buoyancy and then the wind is going to take it around so it will fly in a sine wave pattern we are working on this particular configuration for uh, exploring for mars uh, there are several interesting projects which have been proposed okay one of them is that you deploy an aero deploy a folded aerostat and inflate it and then you can you know release it and with the with the information with a small uh, you know sensor which can collect data and transmit that perfect data so this is one particular uh, project also we are working on this particular project and then for titan there has been lot of studies uh, you know because the conditions are very very uh dense and cold but it's a perfect place for hot air balloons so one of the suggestions is to use radio isotope thermoelectric generators which can generate the required uh heat and with that heat you can create the change in the buoyancy so i'm not going to spend too much time on this on those who are interested uh, can send an email to me and be in touch with me i want to uh quickly uh maybe i should stop once again and take any further questions uh arpine has a question about do you think airships will be used for tourism my answer is they are already being used for tourism but in very very specific areas and many places have tried but because of several other commercial reasons they have not been able to sustain the economic model the only successful model for using airships for tourism is happening in friedrichshafen germany that is my my knowledge is that that is the, that is the currently the only place where airships are being used routinely for uh, the tourism because there are huge challenges in operating airships for tourism those challenges have to be surmounted first and only then we can think of uh, you know using them regularly so are there any questions about usage of airships for planetary exploration we can take a few questions quickly and then we can uh, you know proceed ahead with the last aspect i want to touch today uh, yeah, but, because of shortage of time yeah i, I do have a question <clears throat> because our our, our prime mention about this tourism so initially i took it as a space tourism but you know there is actually a company called the space perspective they are using the balloon uh how did you balloon for the space tourism but i don't know if it's actually um already uh, in the, but they they have a website uh yeah, so yeah yeah i know i know i know they 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 will qualify under the lts system 
okay they will qualify under an lte system but i did not cover about them because they are still in the design phase oh i see so, yeah 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 best of my knowledge they are not actually operating any flights ah ha but it's a it's a nice concept where they would like to use uh, balloons for operating so that's what you said is the high altitude balloon right that's uh, what you said yes but it will not go to such, yeah exactly the, that is a kind of an application of a high altitude uh, airship using a using a gas filled balloon i see and the other thing you mentioned about this arena thing are you talking about the vamp the north of roman has a proposal on the website it's a it's a venus atmosphere maneuverable you know uh, there's a balloon saying vamp it called a vamp you know for is uh, they go to venus and stay as uh, the 180 atmosphere pressure uh, and stay there you know um, to some exploration uh, are you referring to that uh, kind of project like yes yes i'm i'm referring to a project where uh, the idea is to be able to operate uh, an aerial platform for long duration which can benefit it can go up and down by the change in the buoyancy and it can be thrown around because of the winds on winds so with that it increases the yeah so there is a there is a website link which has been shared that's great so there are many such projects which are going on and so many space agencies are looking at different different alternatives to explore uh, venus the most common ones are venus mars and titan okay these are the three ones which are mostly being explored by various agencies yeah these are so exciting i i, I wish uh, you know uh... Uh, NASA or, or somebody can uh, deploy your design uh, as soon as possible to explore those those places. This is yeah, so yeah. exciting. There are, so there are see there are several projects which have already been uh, worked out and they have been boxed for a future application. All right, let me just go back to the last uh, presentation I want to share with you, which is I would say in many ways the future of uh, airships uh, because. conventional airships have huge limitations and those limitations are <clears throat> to be overcome by newer designs and those designs are hybrid airships okay so what are hybrid airships these are a combination of aerodynamic lift and buoyant lift far more than what we saw in a conventional airship in a conventional airship when the airship moves around 20% of the lift could come from Uh, the you know come come from the dynamic one but when the dynamic lift is 40% 30% or more you know then you call it as a hybrid airship okay so usually we make them as multi load because they give much better aerodynamic performance okay and so why the word hybrid comes the, it comes because it combines the advantages of both lta and hta vehicles okay so it's a combination and we try to get good features from both and that is why these are very promising in fact i would like to predict that the hybrid airships are going to very soon replace the conventional airships okay now there are two main types one of them is called as dynastats which basically have a fixed wing as a lifting surface or they may have an aerodynamic hull itself which also creates lift okay so there are two types in this there is a winged hull and a lifting body you can see on the bottom left a small experimental airship where you have a conventional airship and below that you have some wing type wing and tail type configurations okay <coughs> excuse me and on the right we have the lifting body where the shape itself is such that it will generate aerodynamic lift as it moves in the air such airships are suitable for light transport and surveillance applications but then somebody asked me about transporting heavy cargo for transporting heavy cargo we can go for rota stats which are combination between an airship and a helicopter or a airship and a quadcopter these are vtol capable and they use rotary wings for lift which can be then augmented or it can also be twisted now this is a very huge design challenge and many companies have attempted here you see the jhl 40 skyhook okay <clears throat> but all of them are in the stage of development some of them have gone for testing some of them have not been able to uh, you know reach but these are the ones which are considered to be very promising now 
you can see the difference between conventional and hybrid airships and why i say that hybrid airships are going to slowly uh, take over and you know in the future they will be the ones that we will see because most of the facility most of the features of hybrid airships are to overcome the limitations of conventional airships okay. so a study was carried out in 2018 by shoffle where uh, shoffle where you can see that the orange lines and yellow lines correspond to hybrid airship for a particular mission and the blue lines correspond to a conventional blimp type airship okay so while the aerodynamic efficiency of a blimp is quite good much better however if you look at fuel burn per ton mile there also they are better okay but if you look at other aspects like what is the payload range what is the minimum power required and the productivity which is where you know you find that the <clears throat> hybrid airships are going to uh, work out so you know we are also doing a study on conventional versus hybrid airships the first one was way back in the 60s called as arion 3 which had these you can see in the top right three envelopes joined together okay but this was a rigid airship it was the structure was rigid okay. and then modern dynastats are these two the lockheed martin had done a very successful trial of the p791 but this project is now suspended and the one on the right airlander is the one that had an accident recently so there was a setback but setbacks are a part of aviation growth so i'm not too much worried they are back with a bang now and they are now trying to go for the next trial so this is the future and i'd like to show you a very short video uh sorry i think i just uh, i'd like to don't know what happened okay uh, finally i have something on solar powered airship but i think we have already spoken about it so i think we can stop here uh, but before i go i'd like to share with you that uh, we have a youtube channel in which we have loaded a lot of videos about all our airship and aerostat trials and uh, we also have a website but i must confess it's very very outdated website so i would request all of you to search for LTA Systems IIT Bombay on a YouTube. You will find our uh, channel. Please subscribe to our channel and also click the bell icon so that you never miss a video. Thank you for your attention. And this is my other email, which is a bit easier to remember because it's just my name at gmail dot com. So if anybody is interested to collaborate with us in any way, whether it's the guys from EPA, EPRF, or you know uh, anybody else any students or anybody who wants to come and work in the lta systems lab or associate with us please don't hesitate to send an email and we will get back to you so i would like to stop by making a couple of announcements number one is that in the month of december one of my phd students who is also a faculty member in a college is going to lead a one week course on lta systems so friends that course is free of cost it's funded by the government of india under the atal fdp program so you are most welcome to send an email to me if you want to attend that course there will be one week of lectures um, perhaps three lectures a day by eminent experts from all over the world it's not only by me or by other people we have invited professionals in lt systems from all over the world and they have agreed we are very happy that they have all agreed to give a talk so do contact us for how to join that particular course and the second thing i want to announce to you is that in the next year june we are planning to conduct an international conference on lta systems okay is going to be called as delta 2022 delta standing for design and evaluation of lta systems so watch out uh, for announcements if you want uh, to be in touch with us you send an email we'll put you in a mailing list and uh, as uh, ken mentioned aiwa conducts uh, these uh, seminars and events there is one coming next week the aviation 2021 i'm happy to share with you that there are two sessions in that particular uh, there are two sessions in that particular conference on lts systems the first one has three papers the next one has two papers i'm happy to share with you 
that we are the authors of all the five papers. So there are five papers available to those who are going to enroll or those who have already enrolled for Aviation 2021. Uh, please do attend our, this time there are video recordings. So please do attend our sessions. And uh, maybe what I can do is I'll try to quickly share. I think I should have included that, but uh, I'll, I'll see if I can uh, locate a, a document which uh, contains the details of those PPTs, of those, of those talks. Just give me one minute. I'll just try to see if I can locate it. Meanwhile, the floor is open for any questions or any queries that you may have. I'll be very happy to try and address them. Uh, Professor, how about the, you mentioned about the UAV, so what's the weight, how, how much weight is a comparison, you know, can, can carry by, by your system and uh, versus the, you know, the kind of comparable UAVs? Okay, airships are going to score much better compared to aircraft. So just a minute, uh, can just, I would just, just like to share with this with you. So these are the papers which we are going to present in the forthcoming, you know, uh, AIAA conference. Uh, the first one is on aerodynamic analysis of axisymmetric LTA vehicles. These are the hybrid airships. Then we are going to present to you a methodology for sizing of a small aerostat system. Uh, after that, there is one paper on the trajectory modeling of phase change rather than their system for Venus exploration, as I mentioned to you. And then we are going to look at conceptual design and the sizing of a relocatable high altitude long endurance solar powered hybrid airship. Okay. And finally, we are going to look at surrogate based aerodynamic optimization, shape optimization of a trilobe hybrid airship envelope. All of them are on 4th of uh, August. And these times which are mentioned here are actually, I think, the Eastern times. Okay. So I would request all of you to please go. Uh, online and check out. Uh, maybe you can just take a picture of this particular screen. <clears throat> I hope my screen is visible. Yes, and it will post online, so uh, more people yeah, yeah. can. And it will correct. post and ask people to to attend uh, your sessions. Correct, correct. And we will be very happy to answer any queries that you may have because these are dedicated towards LTS systems only. So, guys, take a picture, take a screenshot of this. And keep it with you, and we look forward to seeing you in our <coughs> sessions in the conference. Okay, now I'm open to any questions that anybody might have. There are a couple of, uh, there is one question. Uh, this is by Arpin. Uh, with increased solar panel efficiency, how long do you think high altitude airships like Yuan Meng from China may be able to fly? In other words, what do you think the duration of the flight might be? The duration of the flights would be anything from six months to one year. That is my assessment because these some of these can use solar cells, which work. You know, they may also work on what is called as solar regenerative fuel cells. So therefore, they will be able to sustain themselves for a very long time. Of course, there are issues with the weather. As the weather changes, there might be some uh, <clears throat> delays. But our calculations show that if you use the top of the range uh, solar cells uh, with solar regenerative fuel cells, it's very easy to maintain six months to one year time. Bhaskar Reddy has a question regarding composite materials used for making parts of the airship body. Yes, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> airship uh, gondola can be made with composite material. Even the fins can be made with composite material. All right, so we are open for any further question that you may have. Also, uh, you mentioned that the materials, uh, so when you, and if, uh, you make this in your lab, you, you make everything in your lab or you give this to some company to distribute? We don't have any facility for making the envelope material. The envelope material we purchase from uh, companies who make this uh, commercially. And because there is a oh, because there is a, some activity in the country happening on airships and aerostats, 
therefore there are companies available in india who can actually supply us the fabric that we need okay but the material is proprietary that i can share i cannot share the details with you so proprietary material okay but it is easily available there is no issue uh, i think one participant has raised the hand um, maybe we should uh, allow her to speak who who uh I don't know. There was one participant who had raised the hand. Was it by mistake? I don't know. If you see her, you can you can you can allow you can allow to talk. I uh, know. I not. I don't see now. Oh, okay, maybe she left. Yeah. So, anyone who has a question or any comment can raise their hand, and we will unmute you, or you can ask your questions in the Q and A box. Oh, uh, just just uh, yeah. Somebody type a question. Yes, there is one question in the Q and A box. Uh, again, from Arpin, thank you so much. And how about cost? On average, how much does creating an airship cost? This is a difficult question to answer because you see, um, as an academician, I always work on small budgets because my budgets don't come from companies; they come mostly from sponsored projects from the government. So. i am able to manage i mean uh, i am able to manage my requirements quite easily because it's not a very ex now i can't give you a number because the number will depend on size and on shape and also on what kind of power plant how many power plants are we using two motors or three motors are we using an ic engine or so you know costing is a function but let me let me just assure you that the costs of making airships are not so prohibitively high that they will come in way of any r and d activity okay and i'll be very happy to associate so many researchers from all over the world have uh, associated with us uh, they they visit our lab we had uh, visitors from abroad who came and uh, worked in our lab so uh, if anybody is interested to collaborate i'll be very happy to uh, you know i'll just uh, once again i'll just share my email address so that Uh, you can contact me if you can give me your specific requirements i can also work out the numbers and tell you what it will cost if you get it made in india and i'll be very happy to help you in getting it done uh, professor why is the the balloon yellow color is any special reason no no there is no special reason it is just that uh, it looks good in photographs that's it so you know airships are designed to be seen because we want people to notice them we want them to uh, it should stand out so we found that the sky is generally blue and the yellow colored envelope stands out very nicely against the blue contrast that's why we have gone mostly for yellow color but we have also made red and all kinds of colors Yeah, we we see this uh, balloon in uh, over our head in Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and uh, you know in the uh, football or baseball forecast, they always have the uh, balloon, you know, uh, flying over. It's uh, it's another thing for as you see, they are designed to be seen, you know, yeah. it's, it's, or like a overhead camera for the stadium or those kind of. Yes, things. yes, and you know they are the best way to cover an event. without disturbing the people below because if you fly helicopter you know, they'll make a lot of vibrations noise they will blow the air below airships are very benign they fly very slowly very smoothly and they catch the attention so you just can't miss if an airship is flying you will definitely get eyeballs yeah commercial you know advertisement you know it's very good yes yes yes, yes. that is why as i said the the contract uh, you know given by uh, the uh, goodyear is continued yeah it's because it's a, it's 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 a, it gives you far more uh, you know punch than the money that you spend on it yeah that's uh, i think it's, it's it's better than uav you know uh, For, much better yeah. for for the purpose of promoting a product see the airship envelope by virtue of its size gives you such a big area to do whatever you want you can you know there are clever applications some people have used small projectors mounted in the gondola which will project on the screen and in the night time you can show movies you can show live movies 
uh, like that in the Times Square, you have these ads which are continuously moving. Similarly, you could have a flying billboard. So several people have done very. It's, it's possible to also put a put a you know a light source inside the balloon and create a glow in the night. Yeah, Professor Mission Glow actually brought a very interesting question. Um, you know, you probably heard about the story of the 1947 Roswell event. And uh, the Air Force claimed that it's the high altitude balloon. It's not the uh, alien or, uh, or, or, or something. And they show some debris or the silver color debris, you know, for the high altitude balloon. But still a lot of people don't believe, you know, the, they think that that's a camouflage. So you say uh -huh. that if the balloon can, can be growing, you know, so a lot of people might mistaken as UFO or something like that. Yes, yes. Actually, quite a few of the UFO sightings probably can be attributed to balloons which have grown into size as they went up. Okay. Uh, anonymous attendee has a question. How stable a platform is high altitude airship compared to other alternatives? So when you compare to other alternatives, it's very good because you see, the amount of power that will be consumed by any other system to remain stationary or to remain stable will be much higher. Yes, uh, by virtue of large size, an airship is definitely more susceptible to side loads and disturbances. But if you operate it at those altitudes, as stratospheric altitude, at the right altitude, where the ambient winds are very low, then you will not have that much of problem. So that the, the trick is at what height we should deploy at a particular location. There's no fixed number for every place because every place in the world has a different altitude, although between 15 to 25 kilometers, but it varies from place to place. As we have found in our studies, there is a different altitude at Beijing, there's a different altitude for Mumbai, different altitude for New York. So the trick is if you are able to match the altitude within this band, with the location, lat long location, then you get a fairly uh, easy, stable uh, platform. Okay. And he also wants to, he or she also says that yellow color is associated with lower Rayleigh scattering, hence the increased visibility. Yes, that's right. You got it. Basically, our main aim was to ensure that the visibility is the maximum. And we found during our experiments that this color gives us the best possible visibility. So we stuck to it. And, uh, but we also have done other colors. I, I don't have to show you, I don't have, but if you visit our channel, you will see that we have made a blue arrow stab, which I showed you, uh, matching the color of my shirt, actually. We have also made uh, uh, red colored and, you know, uh, I think white colored. Instead of using electricity, why can't you use solar power from the sun? That is exactly what we do. That is exactly what I was saying. That if you have, if you have solar powered airships, uh, they can be sustaining their flight for a very long time. So yes, that is exactly what we do. In fact, I had a special presentation on solar powered airship, but it was becoming too much. I thought so. <laughs> I did not show it to you. But those who are interested can you know send me an email, and I'll be very happy to talk to you about solar powered airships. I actually give a lot of presentations these days on electrical airships and solar powered airships at various institutes because they are very intriguing and very promising. Well, Professor, you, you, I think earlier you show a few slides of the high altitude balloons uh, using solar power panel. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, but actually I have a separate presentation in detail on electrical mm -hmm. airships. But okay. again, as you realize, it's already quite a lot of time. So I, I don't want to keep on talking. I mean, unless people are interested, I can go back and show it, but maybe some other time. And maybe, okay. you know, this is not the, this is not the first and the only interaction we are having. Yeah, well, we so, should have more, more uh, uh, lecture from you. Correct. Anybody, uh, okay. Uh, Rahul Nodial has a question, a very good question. Has airship been used in military applications? If, if yes, then isn't the speed a disadvantage? Okay. So Rahul, speed is not everything. Uh, Yes, speed is important, but it all depends upon what. In fact, I'll tell you, speed can be a disadvantage compared to low speed. For example, if you are interested in tracing, let's say, submarines under the water, okay, or any other activity, if you want to do processing, 
uh, if you want to do surveillance, uh, you want to locate even some physically. Airships were heavily used in military application. In fact, in fact, airships were used mainly for military applications earlier, okay? Because they were found to be a very potent source for um, applications like uh, protecting the ships when they were going, the fleet of ships when they were going during the maritime, during the war in the oceans. Uh, there were also many aerostats that were mounted on the ships for giving a larger vision. So, Rahul, I'll talk to you separately and tell you about military applications. Uh, speed is not everything, so there's nothing to worry. I mean, we can't use airships for everything. Okay? You can't use it to chase enemy aircraft and shoot them down. Agreed. Okay. There was another interesting question. Uh, this time it's on the chat window. If it runs on solar power, then how can it fly at night? That's a very good question. So, what we do is, when we use solar re regenerative fuel cells, what we do is that during the daytime, we will have excess power compared to the power required. So that energy can be stored in the battery. And when you fly in the night time, that particular battery can be used to power the airship. So if you are having, let's say, about, about 8 to 10 hours of night time, and if you have the remaining uh, time for the daytime, so during the... Uh, I, actually, this was very nicely covered in the presentation, but I, I just could not show it to you. Uh, it is possible. So, um, the excess power available during the daytime can be stored into an onboard battery and that can be used to power the airship at the night. Okay, so it doesn't run only on solar power. It actually works on solar power with a battery backup. Okay, anybody else? I can go on. You know, I have no problem, but um, anybody else would like to ask any questions regarding airships or make any comments? Uh, do you have any apprehensions about airships, which I could clarify, or about aerostats? Okay, I guess, Ken, we have been here for a very long time. And yeah, yeah, okay. People are exhausted. So yeah, probably. I'll, I'll I'll just over to you. Yeah, it's almost uh, 11.30 over there. Uh, there is one question, though. Oh, yeah. Master Reddy, which is, is airship used to oil and gas sector on rigs instead of helicopter chopper planes? Um, no, not yet. See, transporting people to areas where there can be wind disturbances is the last application I would suggest for uh, an airship. But... Aerial surveillance for locating survivors in case of an accident. Uh, those are areas where airships will score much more over other contemporary aircraft. Okay. So, yes, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know of any airship because uh, I don't know of, see, helicopters can operate from very, very small helipads on the aircraft. Airships will require uh, either a little bit of ground or it may require a much larger area because the size is also very large on its own. So it will require a much larger uh, place. So that's why for niche applications like transporting equipment or evacuating passengers from uh, an oil rig, I don't think uh, aircraft uh, helicopters can be countered. But if you want to use uh, a system for aerial surveillance for relief operations, then airships are much better. Yeah, Professor, you are right. Actually, I have a friend that he, he is very sensitive to the noise. Every night, that he, he hear the, the police helicopter hovering, <clears throat> you know, for monitoring the crime or something, he got very annoyed. You know, uh, some people are very sensitive to the noise. They could not sleep, so. Yeah, yeah. Move. Noise, yeah. vibration, and it also throws a lot of air. There is one more question. Uh, how do we measure solar irradiance on an aerostat? as balloon's shadow covers it. But you know, you are, going to, you are going to mount the solar panels on the top side. So there will be no shadow there. So we, we locate the solar panels on the top side uh, and therefore we avoid the shadow. Same also true for airships also. The panels are not on the bottom side or on the side, they are on the top side.
So okay, can we are almost closing to a two-hour mark? Okay. Okay. So, I have no problem if somebody still wants to ask something. We can maybe use the next four or five minutes to, you know, answer your queries or to go through your comments. Okay. Great. So, uh, so far we will do is let, let's do this. You know, uh, we will uh, conclude the presentation here, uh, but we'll stay online for or for a while. And the professor mentioned he will stay a few more minutes. So, if we any. Yeah, yeah. I question you can in the visual, but let's conclude uh, the presentation for today. And thank you so much, Professor. It's our great pleasure and honor. And uh, as we mentioned, you know, look, look for uh, further opportunities uh, with you uh, lecturing with us. So definitely. And as I mentioned, I'll repeat once again: if anybody is interested to associate with us for anything, okay, I'll again just to make it easy for you. I'll again type. Uh, so I'm putting my email address and anybody who's interested to associate in any way or any queries, I'll be very happy to take your questions. Yeah, and we also posted and uh, also the aviation, uh, AIW aviation link uh, and uh, on the, the, we'll post a video on that page. We'll also post yeah. those information you provided. Right. Uh, your email address. What I do, what I do, can you, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just email you that one page which I have and that contains all the details of our presentations. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. You know, thanks for mm -hmm. letting us know. All right, so we, we conclude the presentation, but we'll stay around, you know, I, um, you know so you're welcome to chat, uh, you know, chat with each other. So we'll bring people, you know, uh, so you can uh, show your camera if you want. Okay, yeah. so uh, yeah. there is a, there is a question by Rasha Eliwa, which says, if they don't see it, can they send a signal? I'm not able to understand what is the exact question. So maybe you can repeat the question with some more clarity, or you can unmute yourself and maybe start speaking. Yeah, I mute everyone. Yeah. So everyone, you are welcome. You know, now it's networking time. You are welcome uh, to, to speak out. So Russia, you, you can speak out, Russia. Or you can type um, it again. Yeah. Um, so oh, why can't they send the signal? Like let them know they're over there in case they don't know where it is. No, but I, I don't see any problem. I mean, what exactly, what exactly is the yeah. question? I mean, are you saying that if the airship is far away, you cannot see it? If they, if they don't see the airship, yeah, um, um, can they send a signal to let them know we're there? Oh yes, oh yes, they can. Uh, oh. see, when you when you fly an airship with remote control, at that time it is important for us to see it. Okay, but mm -hmm. when you are actually flying it autonomously, then the airship itself locates its position with respect to the earth and takes corrective action. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, um, my name is RP. I wanna thank you so much for answering my questions in the Q and A. Uh, my husband, he's an aeronautical engineer. So he's been researching these airships for a long time. And for me, I'm an educator myself. And during COVID, a lot of my students were talking about a difficulty of getting supplies. So I was really interested in your presentation about this issue of cargo. You know, we live here in California. And so we always wonder where there are places where there are remote access to airports and difficulty of getting supplies how good the airships will be to help in that situation. You know, how is their landing? How much can they hold the cargo and be useful in that uh, paradigm? Okay, very good question. Actually, <clears throat> the most promising application of airships is going to be for transporting cargo in remote areas. And uh, there are several researchers who are looking at airships with 20 tons, 50 tons, 100 tons, even 200 tons capacity to transport cargo. 
but there are certain issues. I must share them with you. Uh, the first issue is that in an airship, if you carry 20 tons of cargo, that's fine. I can design it for it. But when it comes back empty, there is going to be a problem mm -hmm. because we need to then balance the 20 tons of buoyancy. You know, there will be excess buoyancy. Of course, there are a, there are a lot of things. So if it is possible that you know you take 20 tons from A to B, and then you come back with something, you know, that would be a much better model. But if you have only one-way transportation, then when you come back empty, there are going to be some issues. Of course, as I said, there can be buoyancy control. And also, Arpit, I'll be very happy to have a session like this with your students. You know, if at any point of time you would like me to have a session like this uh, with your students, definitely. I think I'll, be, be I'll be delighted to do that. Yes. Yeah. So because you can you can send me an email and we will work out. I mean, I can give a talk to you on cargo airships. That would be fantastic because, uh, to be honest with you, on a personal level, um, I work in a community where there are a lot of Armenian students. And in this past uh, year, there was a war in the area. So oh, yeah. we're uh, sending lots of emergency supplies to help them, um, you know, the soldiers and things. And so what was interesting is many of my students asked, well, will it get there? You know, you know, because of COVID, there's so many restrictions. And finally, it took months to get there. But when I saw your ships, I think everybody sees things from the personal angle, you know, how yes. it will help yes. their culture. So definitely, yes. I'll email you and uh, be sure to connect uh, so you can come talk to my yes. students. That would be wonderful. Thank you so much. Yes. I appreciate it. Yes. Because I do a lot of outreach with students in schools and colleges. So it will be real fun to address your students Specifically, on, we'll, we'll exchange emails and fix up what exactly you would like me to cover. And then I can do some research and cover it for you. Thank you again. I appreciate okay. it. Okay. Uh, I think Manish, uh, Manish, do you want to speak out? Well, now I turn over the cam uh, microphone. So anyone you want to speak out, you can just unmute yourself. We are all enabled to speak out, and uh, this is networking time. Uh, before yeah. Professor, uh, the talk is over. Now we, we should just start speaking to each other. The talk is over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now it's not networking time. Yeah. Oh, Jenna, okay. go ahead. Yeah, no, I just want to say thank you too. I'm at a. I teach math at a community college, and I'll pass your name and information along to others in case somebody. From Baker Seal College contacts you sometime in the future. I think you're marvelous, and I appreciate your generosity of spirit of sharing all this wonderful information with us. So thank you. Oh, that's really thank wonderful. You. I, I love I'm every. Very happy. Uh, for those of you, for those of you who are uh, uh, university or school teachers, I want to actually show you a very interesting video. Just give me a minute. I like to share my screen and show you a very interesting video. Uh, I worked, when I was in Singapore, I actually worked with a school. And uh, <clears throat> with the help of another student, we were able to do a very interesting project, which I would like to quickly show you. Okay, so I got it. Um, all right. All right, okay. So I'll show you a small airship that was... Uh, I hope you're able to see my screen. No? Yeah, but it's not started yet. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. There's, then that thing is not playing properly. So I'll I'll just share my screen once again. Yes. I'll just go back. So this is a small airship that was developed uh, in association with a student, uh, he did the 3D printing of all the components and, you know, uh, this envelope was fabricated and then we did a testing within the university only because we were not uh, planning to fly it outside unless we tested it. And uh, <clears throat> once we integrated the whole system, we took it out for some flying. So we did some flying outside first with the small tether attached to it just to ensure that. And then, you know, this is the most interesting part. This airship is now being controlled by a mobile phone. 
so uh, there is a there is a apple apple mobile in the hands of the student and there are three motors which are being controlled remotely through this mobile phone this is a school gymnasium in singapore there is a school called as school of science and technology sst and beautiful you can see these are young students and now the person who is flying uh, you know he is first setting up the whole thing and then very soon he is going to pass on the control to young students who have never done this before and they pick up immediately and they are able to because the system is so benign so slow so easy to control and to train that you know you don't really have much trouble this particular uh, work was found to be so interesting that i had the pleasure of presenting it to uh, the aiwa conference uh, focusing more on the educational aspect you know exciting the students to dabble and try out these kind of uh, systems and it was done within a matter of about a couple of months <clears throat> i'll also show you another small video if you allow me of what i did in texas a&m university with some students when i spent a couple of months uh, in 2011 uh, a similar project but these were likely uh, senior students uh, but called uh, as a tamu blim Okay. Contact. Is it visible? I don't know whether it's visible. Sometimes I have a problem in sharing. I think it should be visible now. Can you see that now? Yes. So this is a, a small, a small hall in which I first gave a talk about airships and how they work, and then we actually did a demonstration inside the hall. Uh, and then there was a foyer outside, and uh, they, this airship was built using the envelope supplied by a company in California. And the interesting part is that when I placed the order for the envelope after designing it, they said that it will be procured from a company in India. because they said it is cheaper for us to order it from a company in india and get it delivered to the us so they took 3 weeks because it was coming in from india and the control system the the motors the battery etc they are all available and within a matter of around 2 weeks the students were able to learn how to fly and how to operate it that's mainly because of the very benign nature even if it goes and bumps the wall nothing happens compare this with a quadcopter or an aircraft if you lose control it may go and injure somebody and this one is just you know very slowly smoothly flying and doesn't even disturb the people below who are doing their uh, homework and somebody asked me about the cost so this whole project was done at a cost of around 3 and a half thousand dollars that is what my memory my memory maybe i am a bit off the complete thing is costing 3 and a half thousand dollars including the control system including uh you know the the gas this is this one is having helium inside Now you're right, professor. Sometimes the the drones, UAV, they are a little menacing. You know the the you know the noise. Oh yeah, see in the hands of an expert. Dangerous. Correct. In the hands of an expert, they are okay. But imagine if there are some students who are just experimenting and then they suddenly yeah. lose control. They would actually go and cause injury. Very impressive. This is lovely. Yeah. So this can be replicated at any institute, actually, very easily. And you see, it just slowly comes down, and then you can just hold it. There's no danger. There's no sharp parts. The only problem is the size. It has to be of some minimum size. 
but it's inflatable, right? You can uh, feel the air on side. Sorry, what is it? It's inf inflatable, right? You can put the uh, the air on side. Yeah, yeah, this is inflatable. So the envelope comes in a deflated uh, form and we just uh, inflate it with the gas. Yeah, so it's uh, the shipment is smaller, so it's, it should be not yeah. too bad. There is a question from Russia saying that if it is so small, I don't see the point, it, can, it can't hold a human. Russia, you are right, but if you want to hold a human, you need to make it a bigger one. This <laughs> one is not meant to fly a human. This one is meant to just train the students and to educate them about airships. Okay, even the one that you see behind me was able to lift around uh, six and a half kilograms, but at the height of six and a half thousand feet. So um, we don't uh, we we are in an educational environment, so we are not able to make such large airship that can carry humans. But companies routinely make. I showed you a video of an airship that can carry fifteen passengers. Yeah, sir. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, sir. Uh, this is Suranjana. I'd like to thank you for the awesome presentation. I just want to know that what is the scope of uh, upcoming research of a hybrid airship and renewable energy for the okay. bigger airship? Yeah, yeah. So I already have one PhD student working on hybrid airship. He's about to finish. By hopefully by the end of this year, he would have finished his thesis. He is working on the design of hybrid airships to meet a particular requirement for high altitude operation. There is another student who has joined just recently from January this year. He is going to look at the propulsion system. The pro Let me just check if he's there on board. He is going to look at the propulsion system of, uh, you know, <clears throat> these uh, airships. Yeah, he's there on board. Shashwat is there on board. So he's going to focus on the propulsion system of um, airships and how to optimize them, whether we should use fuel cells or whether we should use some other uh, technology. Uh, so yes, so the future of aviation is going to be only if you make it green, if you reduce yes. emissions, if you use non-fossil fuels. So there is a huge potential for development of green airships. Yes. I remember. I remember I, when I was in Virginia Tech, I supervised a group of six students who, who wrote a paper on green airships, and I think it was presented again in an AAA conference. So, if you are interested, Suranjana, you can just send an email to me. I'll be very happy to share with you these details. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, anyone, any questions? This is a networking network time uh, to interact with a, a speaker. Uh, so, yeah, it's great. You know, uh, Professor showed us, uh, you know, this uh, exciting <clears throat> demo, you know, uh, in, in the schools, and uh, it's, it's really, very exciting. And okay, very if you guys, if you guys have a patience, I want to show you one more video, which is a great. very, very interesting one. Please Again, do. it is a student project, because there are many educators here, so I thought I'll I'll just try to showcase them what all things can students do when they work with us. I'll show you a small biomimetic airship. Okay, the one that tries to mimic, uh, the one that tries to mimic nature. And again, it's a, it's a student project, uh, which, okay. Uh, are you able to see the screen? Yes. Okay, I have not played the video yet. I'll just play it now. Oops, this <clears throat> Okay, so you can see this is a small blimp that was made by some interns. Uh, this is our laboratory. We do our trials in the lab first, and then we take. You can see there is a big airship on the ground. And, uh, you know, so you can see this. Now, this is very exciting because this is a silent airship. It, uh, it achieves thrust by the flapping of the tail, and we are trying to mimic a fish here. Okay. This is the rainbow trout design. And interestingly, the size of the tail and the flapping frequency has to be very carefully chosen. Because if you simply flap the tail at some frequency, you will not get the thrust. You will not, the, the, the airship will simply stay at one place. 
and look at how it can maneuver from the tight corners and still fly. So we do a lot of work also on biomimetic systems. I wish I could have included that in the presentation. Uh, for those who are interested from the educational community, I would like to actually give a presentation on what all interesting projects we have done with students. I remember I, I had presented a, a paper on you know, teaching design engineering to students using innovative LTS. Hey, so, so oh, oh, the yellow is not the best. It should be more red because the yellow might blend in with the sun. So, I what you say is right. What you say is right. What you say is right. The thing is that we normally don't fly when there is bright sun because. The bright sun means there's going to be a lot of heat. And when it is very hot, then the envelope tends to have higher pressure because of expansion. Uh, uh, we okay. fly generally when the sky is blue, and at that time, yellow stands out. Uh, okay. Okay. But it's a very good question. It shows that you are really thinking while you are uh, doing it. Uh, okay. While uh, Another in interesting video that will show you a white airship uh, there is another one which I'd like to show you. Oh, okay. Mm. Right. So this one is, uh, yeah. So what I'll do is first I, okay. Mm. Right. Um, okay. So this one is uh, a small outdoor airship. You can see it now, it's white color. Yeah. Yeah. So this one is an airship that we flew outdoors in our university ground. Okay. Earlier, we put a long cable because we were not very sure how she will behave. And on the bottom, you see my research team, the people who worked with me at that time. This was shot in 2013, November. And once we realize that we have adequate control, then we actually, uh, you know, deleted the tether and just kept small uh, cables there. So very soon you will see aerial camera, what it shows when you fly the airship. So yeah, here it is. So this is the onboard camera. Uh, this is my campus. Uh, there's a, there is a ground in, our, in my campus. Of course, there have been, and this is the beautiful campus where I reside. There is a beautiful lake as part of our campus. And all these trees are, these are the halls of residence that you see. So we have a very green campus where we uh, work. And in my university, everybody stays on campus, the faculty and the students. Nobody, uh, none of my students stay outside. So this is the slow flying airship from the ground. Those are the halls of residences that you see. And those buildings on the back are the faculty apartments. And of course, one of them is the hostel under construction, which is now ready. So you see, if you want to take aerial images of a location very slowly in a relaxed manner, nothing better than flying a small airship. And you see how smoothly she comes and lands. Okay. Right. I could go on and on. I have so many videos. And interestingly, all of these videos are available on our YouTube channel so that anybody can just watch them. <clears throat> Yeah, that's amazing. Well, definitely post that link, you know, uh, along with the video today. Right. Yeah. yeah, these are very inspiring. Oh, I think uh, Kanisha wants to say something. Oh. There is a hand raised by Rasha. Rasha, do you want to share something or do you want to ask something? Uh, me? Yeah. Um, yes. Um, so, oh, the camera takes, does it take pictures or videos? 
we have a choice. Uh, we can put a video camera or we can put a fi uh, fixed camera. It's up to us. In one of my previous, oh. uh, in one of my previous um, uh, videos, I showed you a fixed camera, but in this one, I put a video camera. Oh, so, and by the way, my name's not Russell. My name is Adam. I'm just using my mom's account. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had no way of knowing. <laughs> Thank you so much for telling me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're right. I mean, these are so inspiring. You know, it's uh, great for, you know, uh, showing people and uh, initially didn't realize in the beginning because you're more talking about this a professional, um, you know, thing. Either, but this is uh, for education is certainly very, very important part. Very oh, important. yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. And they deserve another great presentation itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah, but you're right. I mean, uh, those, those really, um, you know, much safer and uh, much uh, kind of, um, intuitive and uh, easier for, for the educator and the student to deploy and learn. Yeah, their only problem is that they are large in size. So with a quadcopter, you can maybe make it uh, six inches, 10 inches, even a palm top. But uh, for an airship, just to lift itself with zero payload, also you need a minimum, uh, typically about two meters, one and a half meters minimum. That's the problem. So storage becomes an issue sometimes and then there are limited space. And then where do you fly it? Because the volume of the space available could be small. But just, just from my side, I feel, for example, uh, a stadium, you know, a, a, a sports stadium, and they don't have the games all the time. You know, it's a good location. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. And um, when students are experimenting, I would recommend an indoor stadium is a very good one because if they lose control or if they commit a mistake, uh, in the case of an aircraft, it will fall to the ground because of our dear gravity. But in case of a balloon, it will go out of control. So the initial testing and trials, even in Texas A&M, we actually uh, located a place with very large, long corridors and all our initial trials and training was done in those indoor long corridors. It also was very hot. I was there in the month of uh, June and July. Oh. It was extremely hot, as you know. Uh, Amazing. I was in College Station, so it was very, very hot. So it was good to be in an air-conditioned environment. Uh, <clears throat> it would have been very difficult to fly it outdoor, except early morning and late evening when the winds are very calm. But you are right. I mean, when I saw your video, it's doing in, in the indoor, um, in, indoor like uh, uh, area, and I immediately realized, you know, I have been kind of doing outreach, you know, exhibition in, in some schools. You know, uh, school mostly have this kind of uh, indoor, you know, for for. Um, uh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Such fires are available almost everywhere. Yeah, and yeah. Then they don't use it all the time. Yeah, not one. Sometimes we can also get by by putting a small netting. You know, a small yeah. net can be put uh, in yeah. case you have a kind of a place. Okay, so the hand has been raised once again. So yes, go ahead. Uh, so, oh, if they don't usually fly in the sun because us of the yellow um airship, then how do they get solar power? No, um, let me clarify my answer. Basically, I don't fly every airship with solar power. Okay, so when uh, I fly, yeah, so when I fly with solar power, definitely I have to be in the sun. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So Kanishka can type out. Yes. Uh, right. You can type out. Can you provide more information on the research regarding LTA vehicles in the Venus atmosphere? So Kanishka, what I would suggest is you do a simple Google search on um, Venus exploration using LTA systems. We have done a survey on that. And we have published a paper. Alternatively, you, Kanishka, you can just email me and I'll send you that paper. So that paper is very extensive. It 
is written by one of my phd students and it has a survey of all the uh, studies done in the last uh, i think 60 70 years <coughs> on uh, exploration of venus using lts systems so we'll be able to share it with you okay just send an email and i'll be very happy to share no professor actually I, when you mentioned i was about to ask you i, I heard that india has a mission uh, to explore venus uh, in the next few years will this uh, yes. uh, lta be included in that mission well i can't say right now but we oh. are working on a project trying to convince the uh, indian space research organization that this could be one of the alternatives so uh, we have we are going to uh, you know propose to them so that's what we are doing studies on that so they are interested because uh, they have funded a two year study which is coming an end by the end of this year and subsequently i am very confident of getting a further extension on some other application so yes uh, there is a plan but i don't know whether it will happen in the next 5 years or 2 years or how much time it will take yeah the venus is how try exciting nasa just approved uh, the two uh grants you know for the venus exploration uh one is called da vinci and the other i forgot the name and the japan also want to go to venus they have uh, akatsuki or, uh, already uh the esa also want to go uh you know so it's kind of very very exciting uh, venus very good yeah so if you know some people who work in this i please put me in touch with them i would be very happy to start collaborating with them Okay. Okay. And Manish, type a question. Manish Tripathi. Okay. Uh, could airships be considered the next venture for regional flight transportation applications in India? No, I would say no, Manish, because I would not like to pitch airships in an arena where they will not be able to score better than a fixed wing aircraft. Okay. So airships are not suitable. to compete against an aircraft if an aircraft can do something efficiently then saying that we will fly an airship as a competition is going to be you are fighting a losing battle okay because regional air transportation normally occurs in an established transportation system like airports okay but if you say that for example if you say uh, we want to prospect for oil in a remote area and we don't have uh, you know any facilities there now we want to transport items there which can be assembled and then used for testing purposes if we find oil great we will pitch our tents there and we will uh, you know do we will spend money there but suppose you don't find oil then why waste the money today what happens is when people explore for oil in a remote area they build a road to that area first okay and then they will set up so much of infrastructure and after 3 months 4 months 6 months they come to know that oh there is no oil here so now what of course the local population is benefited by the facilities i don't deny that but from the purpose of exploring oil you know it's a waste now they have to go to some other place and again build a road and give the infrastructure with an airship you can actually bypass this so think of such applications where aircraft or rotorcraft like helicopters may not be able to be used efficiently and then you bring in airships and say wow now this is an opportunity for airships uh, other modes are going to have great investment required airship may not require that much investment comparatively because the infrastructure support definitely is needed i am not saying that airships can fly with no infrastructure yes you need some infrastructure but it is far less and less uh, expensive as compared to setting up a detailed infrastructure so i would not like to compete with aircraft each one has their own speciality i would like to use airships for uh, you know like arpin said transportation of cargo in remote areas that is where air ships will score over aircraft professor of course there is a, there is a lot of work to be done still um, sorry to interrupt you but i must just tell you that there is a professor called uh, professor barry prentice who is uh, a professor of transportation economics in 
University of Manitoba in Canada. He has been working relentlessly in trying to make a commercial case or an economic case for airships for transportation. He also used to run an airship company. So it's, it's amazing the kind of work he does, the kind of uh, problems that he is going to uh, address. There are several applications where people have not even considered other modes. You know, in they build an ice, there is a there are there are ice roads which are, you know, for the trucks are traveling for hours together. And you know, there are so many, so much of infrastructure is required to even allow transportation. We can avoid most of it if you use airships. So uh, there is a question in the chat from Janet about how do drones compete for initial exploration for our remote regions? Uh, yes, drones can also do the same job, but drones have a limited endurance. Uh, whereas the endurance of drones is a few hours, the endurance of airships can be a few days, especially if you go for autonomous airships. So whenever you have a requirement for long endurance um, surveillance, then airships are, and are going to really score over. Plus, airships can suddenly remain stationary. Of course, there are some quadcopters which can do that. So, we have to look at this. There is also, a, um, okay, so there is some question about optimization. So, yes, Kanishka, I do a lot of work in optimization and I use genetic algorithms I've been using for the last 20 years, including in my own PhD research. So, don't worry, I will be very happy. Uh, the question that you have asked is very interesting. Is it mandatory to perform optimization? The answer is in today's scenario, you cannot just say that this design is feasible, please accept it. Nobody will take it unless you prove that perhaps there can be no better design. So for that, you need to do optimization so that the resources are not wasted. So merely because something can do something is not enough. It's very important to actually be able to show that it is the best. If you want to present it and you know want someone to accept it. So optimization becomes by default. So I'll be interacting with you separately on optimization if you want. The latest stage. Okay, guys. So it's it's just crossed midnight at my place. So I think we should uh, call it a day. And I'll be very happy to have one-to-one -one interactions with anybody who is interested to talk to me about airships. And uh, I think, Ken, we should now call it a day because it's quite a late. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Professor. It's uh, staying so late. So uh, let's uh, thank uh, Professor uh, so much. It's, it's really inspiring. Uh, uh, Everybody is so happy about this. It's really amazing. So truly appreciate it. Uh, so uh, stay in touch. I uh, wish to see you, uh, you know, have your lecture again in the near future. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us and this conclude the networking and also the event today. So awesome. see you next time. Thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, RP. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much. It's awesome. Bye. Thank you. Stay, in touch. Stay in touch. See you later. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Take care all. Thank you, Ida. Thank you.